Hello, and welcome to another episode of Nostalgic Mystery Radio. I'm your host, Stevie K, and it's my honor to bring you the radio shows of yesteryear. For today's episode, I bring you Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot in The Trail Led to Death, originally aired November 23rd, 1945, where Poirot declines to help another private detective find a beautiful nurse, and then two separate nurses turn up dead. So sit back and relax, and I hope you enjoy this Nostalgic Mystery Radio. Thank you for listening. Crime and the little gray cells, these will always catch the criminal. Hercule Poirot, Detective Extraordinary. From the thrill-packed pages of Agatha Christie's unforgettable stories of corpses, clues, and crime, Mutual now brings you, complete with bowler hat and magnificent mustache, your favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Harold Huber in The Trail Led to Death. Tom Gorman. May I come in? No, certainly, Monsieur Gorman. I'm in a funny spot, Mr. Perrault. <laughs> I hate clients who start that way myself. But You uh, are a detective, Monsieur. Yeah, I'm uh, what you might call a competitor of yours. Gorman Detective Agency. No job too small or too large. You've uh, heard of me? I regret to say, Monsieur, I have not. Well, then how did you know I was a detective? Oh, come, come, Monsieur. The significant bulge under your shoulder. A shoulder holster for your gun, n'est-ce pas? And still, nothing furtive about your movements which would mark the criminal. Merely a certain slyness in your manner. Hey, you don't seem to think much of detectives. Being one myself, I am allowed to take liberties, eh? Well, it doesn't matter. I've heard of you, and that's why I'm here. To get a little help. Monsieur Gorman, I think you have made a mistake. My services are not for hire. No, no, don't get on your high horse. I know how you've been helping Stevens down at Homicide. And I have a proposition here that will interest you. Monsieur, I have found in my experience that the propositions such as you speak of do not interest me. Now, wait a minute. I know that compared to you, I'm just a punk. I haven't got your brains, and don't figure for a minute that I have. I'm used to dealing with mugs, and it's mugs I know how to handle. But, well, this thing is, is different. And all I ask is for you to listen to what I have to say. Then you can give me the brush off if you don't like it. That seems reasonable, monsieur. I've been hired to find a girl. Here's a picture. All I've got to go on is this picture, her name, Elizabeth Dorn, and the fact that she's a nurse. Hmm. These pictures seem to be quite a few years old, monsieur. You can say that again. That's just one of the things that makes it so tough. The people who want this gal located haven't seen her in 15 years, but they're sure anxious to find her now. 10,000 bucks worth anxious. And that's why I came to you. Pardon. I do not understand. Look, this is big time stuff. Ordinarily, I'd never get a look in on a case like this. But for some reason, I can't figure out these people came to me. I know when I'm licked, I tried every angle I could to find this dame. I figured that if she were 30 when this picture was taken, she'd be about 45 now. Now that I'm licked, and I admit it, but I don't want to give up that 10 grand. And you want me to find these Mademoiselle Dorn, eh? I figured you might help me. I'd uh, split the fee with you. I am sorry, monsieur, but this is out of the question. What? You mean you won't? Exactly. But, monsieur Gorman, I wish you luck, and here is one bit of advice. What? You might ask yourself why these people who have not seen Mademoiselle for 15 years are suddenly so anxious to locate her. Huh, who cares? 10,000 bucks is 10,000 bucks. And sometimes, Monsieur, $10,000 has upon it the smell of the grave. Hello? Hello. Uh, Dilly? Oh, Elizabeth. How are you, dear? Worried, Dilly, worried sick. Well, they, they haven't found you, have they? No, thank heaven, but I feel this is the year. Well, uh, you've stayed away from them for over ten years now. What What makes you think they'll find you? Oh, I'm not worried about myself, Dilly. It, it, it's Jimmy. If they ever get their hands on him, I... Now, stop worrying. It won't do you, nor the boy, nor, nor your work any good. Oh, Dilly, you're a wonderful person and a real comfort to me. I, I don't know what I'd have done without you. <laughs> You'd have done very well. You always had courage and brains. But I, 
I- I'm beginning to get that feeling again, Dilly, about uh, about things closing in on me. Uh, uh, where's Jimmy? I sent him away to the country. Usual place? Yes. And Dilly, if anything happens to me... Is it? Now, listen stop to me, Dilly. imagining things. Listen to me. If anything happens to me, I want you to take care of Jimmy. You know I will. He'll be 21 in another month. And if anything should happen, I want you to tell him the whole story. I'll do better than that. I'll tell the police so that we can catch the thieving scoundrels. All right, Dilly. You're sure you don't want to tell the police now? I can't, because then I'd have to tell Jimmy, too. Well, all right, Elizabeth. You can count on me, dear. Oh, heaven bless you, Dilly. Goodbye. Wait 20 minutes for the next bus. Good evening. I said good evening. Look, I'm not trying to pick you up. I just want to know your name. <laughs> Come here, you fool. I just want to ask you a few questions. Let go of me. Let go of me. I'll scream. Help! Help! Now, now listen. Is your name Dawn? Is it? If I let you go, will you answer? Just shake your head, yes or no. No, my name isn't Dawn. I'm going to call the police. Help! Police! Help! If you hadn't yelled, you poor fool, you might still be alive. Ah, good morning, Monsieur Stevens. Well, 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 you are indeed a faithful public servant. Whenever I come to your office... I find you working diligently at your desk, eh? Being the head of the homicide department in this town is no joke, Poirot. But today I can relax. Things have been pretty quiet around here lately. Around here, perhaps. But what about the borough of Queens? Was it not there that a nurse by the name of Molly Ward was killed last night? Yeah. Too bad, but that's just a routine job. Looks like a mugging to me. I've got Collins on it. Do you have a picture of this Mademoiselle Ward? Uh, Sure. Here's the police picture taken out there. Her face is badly battered. Well, that's what you'd expect when she's been battered over the head with a blackjack. Yes, mon ami. But why should a poor, unimportant nurse by the name of Mademoiselle Molly Ward be selected for being hit over the head and in such a lonely section of the city? She wasn't selected, Poirot. Some guy was waiting around and tried to mug her and take her purse. She put up a fight and buffled. Hmm, perhaps. Uh, Dido, what do you know of a private detective named Tom Gorman? <laughs> Gorman Detective Agency. No job too large or too small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tom's a small-time operator. He'll chisel a little, but nothing serious. Hey, wait a minute, Poirot. You know something I don't. How is this Gorman hooked up with a nurse mugging? I don't know that he is, mon vieux, but he came to me yesterday with the... Police headquarters, Stephen speaking. What? Where? I'll be right over. Come on, Poirot. Another nurse has just been knocked off. Right in General Hospital. <laughs> Miss Wood, I understand you're the head nurse here. Why, yes, I am. I'm Inspector Stevens of the New York Police, and this is Hercule Poirot. Oh, yes, I've heard of Mr. Poirot. If anyone can solve this brutal killing, I'm certain he can. Ah, you are most kind, mademoiselle, but it is the good Stevens who is the authority on mugging. Now, now, wait a minute, Poirot. I didn't say this was a case of mugging. Or that it has anything to do with that murder of the nurse out in Queens. But you will admit, mon ami, that the coincidence of two dead nurses gives one furiously to think. Miss Pat. Well, I don't know about this other nurse you're discussing, but I'm willing to swear that Miss Dilly's death was no case of mugging. What makes you say that? Because of the man who came here to see her. What man? What did he look like? Well, it's difficult to describe what the man looked like. All I remember is he was of medium height and wore a blue pinstripe suit. Is it a custom at this hospital to permit nurses to have visitors? As a matter of fact, Mr. Perot, it's not. This man was so insistent that I allowed Miss Dilly to come down to the reception room. What happened then? I don't know, Inspector. When she came into the room, I left. Ah, but is it possible, Mademoiselle, that you overheard perhaps a bit of their conversation before you closed the door? I do remember hearing him ask her if she knew a woman by the name of Elizabeth Dorn. But then I closed the door and couldn't hear any more. Tiens, 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 that is most interesting. Did you know this, Mademoiselle Dorn? No, I'd heard of her. She worked here several years before I came. I've been told that in addition to being an excellent nurse, she was quite a beautiful woman. Ah. Did the unfortunate Miss Dilly know Elizabeth Dawn? Why, I really couldn't say. Come on, Poirot. We've got to lay our hands on that guy in a blue pinstripe suit. Let's get out of here. A little moment, please, Stevens. 
Perhaps Mademoiselle Wood can inform us if she heard any sounds or, or screams in the reception room when she left Mademoiselle Dilly alone with the visitor. No, I couldn't. I'd gone upstairs to my office to check into hospital matters. I first noticed that Miss Dilly hadn't returned to her ward when I checked it about an hour later. Well, there's something behind all this. Ah, a perceptive of you, mon ami. There is indeed. But as yet, it is only a, how do you say, formless shadow. Perhaps a visit to the Gorman Detective Agency will help us to fill in an outline. Hey, open up in there. This is the police. Okay, okay. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. Take your shoulder away from the door, Stevens. He will open it voluntarily. Oh, it's you, Inspector. All right, Gorman, let us in. We want to talk to you. Make yourselves at home. How are you, Perot? I am well, and most happy to see that you are wearing a gray suit. Blue pinstripe is not a healthy pattern just now. What's on your mind, Inspector? Murder, Gorman. Look, I'm a detective, but I don't go out and make my own crimes. If you're talking about that nurse, you're wasting your time. I know nothing about it. Who are you trying to kid, Gorman? Two nurses have been killed. What? Both by the same method, and you stand there and try to tell me, as far as you're concerned, it's all brand new. Two of them. Inspector Stevens has the proper score, Monsieur Gorman. We have just come from the hospital. A nurse by the name of Mademoiselle Dilly was killed there by a man who inquired for Elizabeth Dawn. Hey, Poirot, look at this. Hey, give me that. Oh, not so fast, Gorman. Yeah. What do you make of it, Poirot? Hmm. Perhaps my colleague can explain to us why the name of Sheila Dilly appears on his calendar pad. I, I was going to try and see her tonight. You know, I'm trying to find this Dawn woman, and I got a tip that Dilly might know her whereabouts. <laughs> That's a good one. Come on, Poirot. Let's take him down to headquarters. He'll talk there. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Stevens. I'm on the level. All I'm trying to do is find Elizabeth Dawn for my clients. One of the few clues I have is that she came from Montana, having spent several years there. This silly woman also hails from there. Then it is merely coincidence that her name appears on your calendar, Monsieur Gorman. Of course, Perot. I'm getting 10000 for finding this dame, but if I smelled murder anywhere in the deal, I'd drop it like a shot. I have not accused you of these murders, but you have some information, and you would be most wise to give it to me. Well, Mr. Perot... It seems as our interview yesterday is back for a return engagement. Only this time, you're a little more interested in what I have to say. I can only repeat what I said then, Monsieur Gorman. My services are not for hire, but I dislike murder. You and Stevens are barking up the wrong tree. What uh, makes you think these two killings are connected with what I'm working on? Oh, come, come, come. Is it not apparent to you that other people are interested in the whereabouts of Mademoiselle Dawn? Also, it seems that these people have not your scruples about murder. Sorry, Mr. Perot, but I can't go along with you that these other guys are connected with my clients. But the little gray cells, Monsieur Gorman, they tell me you are making a bad mistake. Well, they don't talk to me, but the 10,000 does. Did your client tell you why he is seeking this Dawn woman? Yeah. He told me that she nursed a sister of his back to health in Montana, and he wants to reward her now. And you believe his story? Ah, not a word of it. But I'm going on the theory that his money is not counterfeit. Now, look here, Gorman. I don't believe you're innocent about these two killings. I got a good mind to lock you up. I told you I know nothing about him. Last night I was up all night in a card game and I can prove it. As for this dilly rap, I don't have a blue pinstripe suit and you can see that for yourself. Then you will not tell us the name of your client. Not a chance. I gave my word. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Perot. Give me 24 hours. If I find that my client hired those guys to knock off those two nurses, I'll turn them into you. Very well, Mr. Gorman. You have made your own bargain. I hope it will be to your advantage. <laughs> Down, Poirot. You'll wear out the floor of my office. What is the matter with those Montana police? The answer to our teletype should have been here hours ago. Hey, what's wrong with you, Poirot? I've never seen you so nervous before. It is the delay of that teletype. I know it will give us the motive for those killings. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. Even if those Montana cops don't send through your message, Gorman's bound to show up here tonight and give us the lead on the murderers. Sacre bleu. Stevens, never have you been so naive. You do not mean to tell me that you trust Monsieur Gorman. Well, frankly, Poirot, I, uh... I've been working on another theory. And you have been keeping it a secret from me, monsieur? But why? Well, I uh, I didn't have it all worked out. But the way I figure it is, a maniac's been responsible for these killings, and unless I miss my guess, we're in for a mess of nurses' death. A maniac? Tell me, Stephen, how do you arrive at these startling conclusions? Oh, it's simple. Some guy who lost a wife or someone else close to him because Elizabeth Dorn botched up the job of nursing her has gone out of his mind and is going around killing all the nurses he can find. Mon ami, it is a pity that all that thought should be wasted on such a worthless theory. Now, 
Oh, come on, Poirot. That message from Montana's coming in over the teletype now. Excellent. Hurry, Stephen. Well, now we'll find out something. Yes, mon brave. I think we begin to arrive in the vicinity of somewhere. Elizabeth Dorn, resident of Butte, 1927 to 1930. Registered nurse, employed last two years here by James and Ellen Fenway as nurse for James Fenway II. All trace lost of her after death of James and Ellen Fenway when she disappeared with their child, adopted by her. Last known to have worked for Dr. Henry Moncton in New York City. Quickly, Stephen. Where to? To find this Dr. Moncton. Yes, gentlemen, I understand you're from the police. What can I do for you? Forgive this intrusion, Dr. Moncton, but we would like some information upon a nurse whom you employed some years ago. Her name was Elizabeth Dawn. Well, gentlemen, you're fortunate. As you see, I'm an old man. My memory isn't what it was in my youth. There have been a lot of people inquiring about Miss Dawn lately. Who are they? What do they look like? I don't think they knew each other. One was a youngish, heavy-set man with a face like a bull. Monsieur Gorman? That, that isn't the name he gave me. It wouldn't be. And the other? The other was a fair man in a blue... Pinstripe suit. Thank you. But about Mademoiselle Dawn. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, Miss Dawn was an extraordinarily good nurse. Very intelligent, and as I remember, very nice to look at. Is that all you know about her? <laughs> well, really, sir, I I don't make it a habit to become great friends with my nurses. But of course not, Doctor. But perhaps you knew of some friends Mademoiselle Dawn had who might be able to help us, eh? Believe us, Doctor, it is most important. Well, that's the same question that the others asked me. And I must have given them the wrong information. What makes you say that? Well, they came to me a few days ago, and I managed to recall with some difficulty that Miss Dawn did have one close friend. A Miss, uh, a Miss Dilly. Dilly? Why, that... Exactly, Stevens. A most logical maniac, Nespa. Please go on, Doctor. Well, then they came back today. Together this time, Doctor? Uh, no, no, still separately. And they told me I must have had the wrong name. Well, then it came to me. I had looked into my files, meanwhile, and I found that Miss Dorn had one close friend who used to look, uh, look after her little boy. Yes, yes, Doctor. And the name of the friend? Uh, Dillon. Miss, uh, Miss Emma Dillon, yes. 957 West 2nd Street. You see, gentlemen, that was how I happened to make the mistake in names. Miss Dorn used to call her Dilly. <laughs> natural mistake on my part. Most natural, Doctor. And most costly. And fatal for poor Mademoiselle Dilly. Come, Stephen. Let us march. This time I'm way ahead of you, Poirot. We've got to get to Miss Dillon, but fast. I, uh, I beg your pardon. You're Miss Dillon, aren't you? Oh, uh, why, well, yes. I, I didn't mean to frighten you. I just want to talk to you about a nursing assignment. Oh. My name is, uh, Arnold Smith. Oh, of course, Mr. Smith. If you'll come upstairs, I'll be happy to discuss it with you. Yes. Very kind of you to see me like this. I, I need your help pretty badly. Well, it's, it's difficult for a nurse to keep office hours. It must be tough to uh, have to climb stairs like these every day. Hmm? Oh, I really don't mind. I'm rather used to it. You live all alone? Yes. It's too late to change my way of living now. Well, here we are. Thank you. Why are you locking the door? Now, don't you be alarmed. But it's necessary that we aren't disturbed. Why? What could you possibly... I'm looking for certain information, Miss Dillon, about a friend of yours. An old friend. A Miss Elizabeth Dorn. I... I don't know anyone by that name. Oh. Well, now you see why I locked the door. It may be necessary for me to jolt your memory. Stay away from me. I... Now, now, you may as well know the truth. And tell it. Dr. Moncton told me you knew her. Now, come out with it. Out with it. Where is she? You... Oh. Put that picture down. No wonder we couldn't find Elizabeth Dawn. We were looking for a nurse, and all the time she was right under our noses. Well, I think I'll just take this along with me in case some other people come around looking for Elizabeth. Who would have thought that Elizabeth Dorn, who was a nurse, could have become Diana Rogers, the famous actress? What are you going to do? Oh! Oh! Goodbye, Miss Dillon. Miss 
Pestillon. Pestillon, open the door. Pestillon, are you all right? It wasn't locked. Mr. Holy smoke. Help, stop him. Help, stay with me. It's all right, Miss Dillon. I'm a detective. Tell me what happened. Uh, a man came. He found out that Elizabeth Thorne was Diana Rogers. And he took all the pictures of her. Got to stop it. Uh, Dead. Diana Rogers. Ah, this is a fine mess. That door will hold. I get out the window. All right, stay where you are, Gorman. Okay, Inspector. Okay, you, you got me. Uh, last one of me, we were too late for the poor Miss Dillon. Yeah, but not too late to catch a murderer. Come along with us, Gorman. <laughs> I tell you, I didn't do it, Inspector. I didn't do it. Now that line has whiskers on it. You're guilty, and don't try to deny it. Look, Mr. Perot, you know I didn't knock off that nurse. Don't pay any attention to him, Poirot. What? This case is all wrapped up. Pardon, mon ami, but is it not significant to you that Monsieur Gorman did not have the murder weapon on his person? What's that got to do with it? I rush into a room, find an old dame with her head bashed in, and a guy hustling out through a window. That's all the proof I need. There is another fact to be considered, Stephen. Monsieur Gorman is not... Psychologically capable of committing murder. Sorry, Poirot, but I don't agree with you. Uh, one little moment, Monsieur, but I should like to ask Monsieur Gorman a question. Yeah, go ahead. Last night you said you would tell us the name of your client if you discovered him to be a murderer. If you are not guilty, then is it not obvious that your employer is? Keep going. There is not much further I can go unless you tell me his name. I've changed my mind. Why, you... He's a welcher in the bargain, Poirot. Monsieur, you are making a grave mistake. You still refuse to tell us the name of your client. That's right. Ah, then you must know where Mademoiselle Dawn is. Ah, you're crazy. Not at all, monsieur. You merely believe you will make better use of your information than we. But come, monsieur, a bargain, eh? If you will tell me where Mademoiselle Dawn is, I will tell you why your employer is so anxious to get in touch with her. How do you know that, Poirot? From spending some time with the newspaper files of Butte, Montana, printed 15 years ago. Okay, that's a deal. Yeah. Fifteen years ago, James and Ellen Fenway died in a train accident. Their estate, which consisted of four of the largest silver mines in the West, was left to their only heir, James Fenway II. Yeah, I remember the kid from the teletype. James Fenway's will appointed as trustees the board of directors of the Arkell Company of Montana. Hey, I think I'm beginning to get it. But the most important thing is that the child was not to receive his ownership of the mines until he reached his 21st birthday. Some birthday present. And from the teletype Inspector Stevens and I received... It is apparent that someone of influence on the Arco Company board is looking for Mademoiselle Dawn. Sure, I've got the whole picture. They don't want the kid to inherit the mine, so they're trying to find him and bump him off. Alas, that is the unhappy situation. Now, Monsieur Gorman, where is Mademoiselle Dawn? Okay, I'll pay off on my end of the deal. She's, she's over in Jersey with the Fenway kid. Here, I'll write down the address for you. Do not take such needless pains. You are lying. I'm only trying to tell you where the darn dame is. All the facts show you are wrong. She is here in New York. Uh, let him go, Poirot. We don't need him anymore. You cannot release him, mon ami. He would not be safe the moment he leaves here. Why, you dirty double-crosser. Monsieur, you... it is you who has given the cross double by lying to me. And you're also not clever enough to realize that to know the whereabouts of Mademoiselle Dawn is fatal. Okay, okay, but what do we do next, Poirot? We go back to the Dillon apartment, Stevens, and use the little gray cells. It is there that we must find the clue leading to Mademoiselle Dawn. <laughs> I don't know, Poirot. We've been through this place with a fine-tooth comb and haven't found a thing. But we cannot allow ourselves to fail, Mon Are Others found things here that helped them. Well, we've ripped open drawers, turned up carpets, and all we've gotten out of the whole thing is a wrecked apartment. Wait, what have you there in your hand? Uh, some old theater programs. Yeah, they belong in this trash bag. No, 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 let me see them. Huh? They don't mean anything except that this Dylan Dame liked the theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this gives one furiously to think. What are you looking at? Pictures? No, mon ami. I have found a most amazing coincidence in all these programs. Regard. What's that? It seems that there is one name which appears in every one of them. So what? Uh, Miss Dillon was a fan of someone. That happens all the time. But the first program is ten years old, and it shows an actress named Diana Rogers playing a most insignificant role. Then look at this next one, seven months later. And this one. Two years after that, in each play, she acted a role of increasing importance. And his last play, Day of Victory, 
Now she is the star. I still don't get... No, dear, that is it, Stevens. You recall how everyone told us that Mademoiselle Dawn was beautiful? Yeah, but what the... Well, we have found her. Elizabeth Dawn is Diana Roger. Holy catfish. I know where she is. That play you mentioned is still on Broadway. Quickly, Stevens, or we will be too late to stop a return performance of murder. This is her dressing room, Mr. Chisholm. Open up, Elizabeth. This is Michael Chisholm. Come on, let us in. It's been a long time, Elizabeth. What do you want, Mr. Chisholm? You know what we want. We want to know where the boy is. I'll make a talk, Mr. Chisholm. I prefer the gentler method, Smith. Well, Elizabeth? Why do you think I took him and ran away from Montana after his parents died? I've often wondered. I knew that you'd been stealing from Mr. Fenway. I also knew that you intended to put the boy out of the way so that you could take over the mines. How true, my dear. But unfortunately for you, your accusations will never be heard outside of this room. What are you going to do? Now, Mr. Chittle? No, Smith. Not just yet. As a matter of Miss Dorn, I beg your pardon. Miss Rogers signing this sheet of paper. What is it? The Fenway boy won't be 21 for two more days. Until that time, you're his legal guardian. This paper signed by you will transfer his shares in the silver mines to me and my company. Now, here's a check for $50,000. 50000 Why, it's worth $5 million. Let's not be mercenary. Now, unless you take this, I'll turn you over to Mr. Smith here. He's already killed three women. A few more won't really matter. I won't do it. Well, there are ways of making you do it. You're hurting me. All right, put up your hands. This would be most advisable, monsieur. And a thousand thanks for the confession. Smith, you blundering idiot. You said we were safe. Ah, but you must permit your employee at least one miscalculation. It is only human. Gentlemen, I... I don't know how to thank you. <laughs> well, now, that's all right. There is one way you can thank us, mademoiselle. Uh, what is that? By allowing us to sit in your theater and watch you give your finest performance. Next week, when Agatha Christie, America's favorite mystery writer, brings you her favorite detective, Hercule Poirot, starring Harold Huber in Murder is a Private Affair. <laughs> Music for Hercule Poirot is composed and conducted by Sylvan Levin. The program is directed by Carl Eastman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mystery Radio presentation. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to like and rate this podcast on your favorite app. Also, there's a Nostalgic Mystery Radio YouTube page for your perusal to subscribe to. You can contact me by emailing me at nostalgicmysteryradio at gmail.com. I hope you have a blessed day or evening. And again, thank you for listening. <laughs>